you for sharing that. Um, and tonight, our third of three, I'm sad to see it be over, but uh, for, our last, for our final grand finale with Paula, but we were already talking to her about coming back, so uh, it will be wonderful. So during the 90s, when Paula was a pro tennis player, she had to find a way to survive. Traveling around the world with a very tight budget and being the only professional tennis player from her country of Costa Rica, she learned about resilience, discipline, and faith. Now, as a mother of five and being a CEO of her company with Paraplegia, <coughs> she is going to share with us today, we are going to learn great tools and resources on how to overcome challenges in life. So please give a warm St. Anna's welcome for our friend. It looks like you want to keep talking, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> so tonight, what I want to share with you is, uh, well, at the beginning, I want to share with you what has been my biggest challenge, uh, or some of the biggest challenges. So one of them was when I was very young, playing tennis, of course. I am the young youngest of seven kids, and my dad can only pay for, you know, food and the house and 
everything. And I just love to play tennis, you know? I remember we were seven, and sometimes the shoes start to get bad and getting holes, and my dad used to use shugu. Or he used to buy like a rubber and put it on the shoes. And, and I wanted to, I, I, then I became number one in my country, but still was very hard. And, and I remember receiving those phone calls for the Costa Rican Tennis Federation saying, uh, we want Paula to represent our country. And, and my dad saying, oh, thank you, it's a great invitation, but you know, and I was just crying behind the door because I knew we didn't have the resources for me to keep moving forward. So with tennis was always, I was always fighting, trying, pushing, and miraculously, I traveled around all the world I will tell you the secrets how I did that. <laughs> uh, but it was pretty really hard only just to go to Panama, the country that was next to us. And of course, of course, uh, you know, the biggest challenge of my life was when I was absolutely paralyzed on my bed. Um, and I can describe you maybe one of the hardest days for me was a day that I was in my bed and uh, my daughter, my nine-year-old, was in charge of the baby that was, I don't know, maybe five months old, and the baby was upstairs, and, and then I, I hear, boom! Oh. And, and I'm just paralyzed in a bed, and I hear the baby crying, and, and then my husband gets so angry with my daughter because she was not taking care of the baby, and I was just thinking, poor baby, Poor daughter, poor husband, and poor me. Oh. You know? <laughs> but there's nothing I can do in this moment of my life. And just being able to contemplate my kids full of necessities uh, that they keep forgetting, forgetting or forgetting? Thank you for teaching me. Forgetting. Forgetting. They keep forgetting that mom was paralyzed because they were used to, you know, another mom and say, Mom, can you close the bottom of my skirt? You know, I'm going to school, and I was just looking at them. Um, or can you help me brush my hair? Everything became a dream for me. You know, do a ponytail for them, or, um, and then looking at my newborn, and not being able to hug him, or carry him in my arms. So, as I described to you, uh, two days ago, the, the physical challenge and the emotional challenge and the spiritual challenge was huge. And it is huge when you deal with a disability. It is like you are very aware of every single movement, of every single thing you do. Um, and it's, it's very difficult. But when you are dealing with a challenge, and, and you will tell me you have the same feeling, what really motivates you to deal with the challenge because the easiest thing is just to take three pills for panic and depression and forget about it and you know but the, the real motivation is the love the love for something the love for somebody that makes you say i need to overcome this challenge i need to find a way to deal with this challenge i need to accommodate my life to what's going on and I would love to tell you my motivation was to get closer to Jesus, to get my salvation, and to be more holy, but I would be fake if I tell you that. Because my real motivation was the love for my children. Where are you, Julie? One of them is here. Julie, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> it, was, it was huge for me. You know, being a mother of five, and, and being paralyzed on that bed, and then my dream became like, oh, I wish I can pick them up from school. I dream of the day I would take them for an ice cream, but imagine how far you are from that if all your body is paralyzed. But it was a huge passion and dream, like I need to get out of this, I need to find a way to get out of this. So, uh, it was interesting because it took me, to prepare these talks, it took me good six, seven hours. Usually I always tell my story and that's it, but you invite me for three days, so I'm like, oof, I better be original, right? <laughs> <laughs> I better bring something new every day. Um, so I started to pray a lot and think, okay, what was really 
what, what, what really helps me to, to get out for my condition. So I want to share with you three principles that I want you to take home today. Um, of course, we're going to talk about faith. But, but I want to share with you, and hopefully it can help you on your challenges in life, okay? So the first one I want to share with you is something we hear everywhere, but I, I just want to go deep on that and see if we can take something out of that. And it's your mindset. That's super important. Valerie, are you here today? No? Oh, she's not. She told me about it last night. A lady that her name is Valerie. Okay, so the mindset is a clear attitude how you are going to handle a situation. Okay? It's a clear attitude how you're going to handle a situation. You're going to handle it on this side, on this side, how I'm going to manage it, what I'm going to do to handle a situation. And also, you're very clear of what is on your mind and why you handle the situation like that. So I was praying and thinking, what was Jesus' mindset? Well, Father Dan, tell me if I'm, if I'm right or wrong because I'm not a nun or a priest. <laughs> but I think Jesus' mindset was salvation. I need to say the word. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter if, if Satan comes on my way, if they crucify me, anything, I have to say the word. I came here for salvation. My mindset was, I want to take chewing for ice cream. I want to go out there. I want to, that is my mindset. And I think, in my lack of knowledge, because I'm not a theologist, our mother Mary's mindset was, I am the servant of the Lord, all the time. So, because I have that mindset, I start to do so many things that I would never do. Maybe if I would be no children, no love in the way, maybe nothing will happen. But I remember when I was all paralyzed on the bed, I said, what can I do to move? Because it was impossible to move. Ah, but I can move in a pool. I don't know what happened in the pool, right? You can move in a pool, you can stand in the pool, I don't know. So I remember saying to the, to the therapist, to the caregiver, Let's go to Shepherd Center and throw him in the pool every day. Because if God changes his mind and my body's gonna come back, I, I cannot be all atrophied. So let's go to the pool and spend a lot of time there every day. It was huge sacrifice, it's exhausting. You have to go and you can't move you in the wheelchair and they push you and they put the table on. But once they throw my body on the pool, I was able to move and be there. And it was hard. It was really hard. It's not, it's not something that you say, oh, this is so easy, you know. But maybe the tennis player mentality was helpful for that. I spent more than 500 hours of therapy trying to figure it out how to do a step. Right? Left, no, move this way, no, do it that way. You know, hours and hours and hours just because I want to take Chewy for ice cream. Because I love her so much. And because I, I was so, I want mom to be able to do something for these children. I remember also paying $150 just to be on the locomat. Oh, there is a picture. <laughs> this is the locomat and it's a machine uh, it's funny because you can see in this, pe in this picture of all my suffering, right, on my face. It was a lot of pain, it was, but it was a machine that stands me up and makes me walk for an hour. It was, I, and it feels good, even if it's, it's not true, but at least, and it was a big effort, it's driving, you know, paying a driver, 
paying $150 to be there for an hour, it was like, when it was my birthday, I say, give me hours of Lokomat because it's so expensive, right? So, but all that mindset was very clear. And then suddenly, when little by little things start to come back, then your goals start to, to change and you start to dream, oh, I can't do this, but now maybe I can do this, but maybe I can do this. Little by little, you know, things coming back until, well, you know, my ultimate dream of being a standing and being walking like you see me today, but driving. <sighs> I couldn't drive a car because my eyes. So, oh, Diana, oh, Chewy, you can go to the car and bring me that, my telescopes, please. Thank you. So, I start to work it out how that would be so nice, but once I was able to walk, and I thought maybe I can drive, but it was, it was a huge uh, investment of time and a lot of things, so, I will share with you how I was able to drive very soon when I'm going to talk about being resourcefulness. Resourcefulness is the word? Resourcefulness. Resourcefulness. But, but being able to drive, I spent maybe a hundred hours of training for that. And it was super cruel. Because once I got my license, they did a mistake on the paperwork, and I had to start over again. Oh. Oh. And it was funny because I got my license that said that I was a hand control because I drive with my hands and with glasses with a telescope. And in the license, they put only hand control. They didn't put telescope. So the day I was in the uh, driver at DSS office, I say to the man on the line, on the line I said, you need to put bioptic. But it was like in Warner Robins. It was like in a very rural area, and the men couldn't understand. You can never have somebody with both conditions ever. It was only one or the other. He says, oh, no, no, you don't need that. I told him three times. <laughs> and, and then, a couple of months later, when my teacher grabs my driver's license, she says, oh, you need to have your bioptic. Uh, let me contact the DSS, and they said, um, you can just put them here too, it's fine. They said, they sent me a letter saying, you need to take this test again, you have 90 days, otherwise we're going to freeze, or how you say, or, you know, revoke, revoke your driver's license. So, my husband says, my husband was super angry, you know, it was not justice. But I said, listen, if I sue them, it's going to be three years. <laughs> and I want to take to see for ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't care, I'm going to do it again. I'm just, I'm just, and I can't explain you, my teacher was, I mean, I live all kinds of situations. When you have a disability, sometimes you are victim of a lot of situations that of injustice, yep. you know, and aggression. I remember one of my driving teachers, the day before the second test, she grabbed my head, she had long nails, and she put them sick on Damn your head! <laughs> and I said, I want to take chili for ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I can fight back, I can tell her, her you know, supervisor, I want to take, this is my goal, this is my mindset. The love for my children. I want to go to Publix for milk. That's it. Don't put emotions in the middle. So it's very important your mindset. The other thing that was very interesting is how my husband deal with the situation. My husband is French. He uh, he was never angry and he was never sad. He was never crying. He was focused. Right, Joey? <laughs> Just, Paula, you're going to be fine. Paula, this is what we have to do. The kids need to go to bed. He didn't sleep for a year. He was a newborn and a body, a piece of meat on a bed that he has to turn right and left. He does his job. Because he knew he put emotions in the middle, it's not going to work.
So sometimes the person that you admire the most is not the person with the disability, it's the caregiver or the husband that deals with that person all their other life in silence, trying to deal with the situations and trying to put the emotions in a sign. And of course, sometimes they are exhausting. So my husband, is a, I admire him because he never complained and he was just doing what he has to do at the moment. So I want to motivate you for you on that too. As Jesus says, I'm going to save the world. As Mary says, I'm going to be the servant of the Lord. What is your mindset? Or sometimes something that helps a lot of the mindset is little phrases that we always say, little phrases that we always keep in our heart. Do you have that? Yes. Yes? Yeah, yes. Like for example, when I'm going to bed and I'm thinking too much, or it's like at four or five o'clock in the morning, like all women's, right? Yeah. You start to yeah. <laughs> Then we start to pray Hail Mary's and feel it on, trying to I think that. So I always say a phrase of, of a priest that teaches me in a spiritual exercise that says, Silence in the mind and peace in the heart. Silence in your mind and peace in your heart. So you keep that always close to you. What are you going to say to yourself when the crisis comes or when you feel like that? So guess what? I have a game. Hopefully you're going to like it, okay? One second. I have a tennis racket. So let me try, okay? So I'm, I'm tossing balls, and if you grab the ball, I want you to say either a mindset or a phrase. Now, if you are too scared to share, you just say, pass, and give it to the person next to you, okay? Are you ready? Hold your water. Okay, let's see who's going to get it. Right. There we go, Tom. Can you stand up and tell us your phrase or your mindset? Yes. Oh, I, I, uh, in lines with your silence in mind, it's a quiet, quiet mind. It's, it's a place to be. Can you repeat it, please? Quiet mind is a place to be. Everybody repeat. Quiet, quiet mind is a place to be. Dianita, you can bring me the ball back, please. All right, here I go again. Are you ready? Cha cha cha. Cha cha cha. Watch out, Carlitos. Hi! Hi! All right, you're gonna have to grab it. Sorry, Carlos. Carlos. All right. Let's see. Stay calm, stay positive. All right, stay positive. Everybody say, stay positive. Stay positive. Okay, here we go. Let me try to go back a little bit. Ready? I It's all good. It's all good. Let's see if I can catch it. Oh. <laughs> so we have it's all good and stay positive. And what is the other one? Okay, what about phrases of saints or something like that, right? Let's go a little bit spiritual too, right? Okay, let me try to go a little bit lower and I hope I'm not going to hurt anybody, okay? <laughs> Vamos a ir, 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 or anybody really want to say something and I'm going to throw in the ball to you? Don't be shy. Carpe diem. Okay, Karen. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Can you say it again, please? I surrender to Jesus and care of everything. Okay. There we go. Yes. God has the master plan. Wow. Clap for that one. Bob! You oh, want to... Carpe 
Seize the day. Seize the day. Oh, yes. All right. From the Latin. Very good. Okay, so now we know the first principle. The, oh, one more? Jesus, I trust you. Oh, yeah. We need that one, right? All day. Jesus, I trust in you. Okay, very nice. Very good. So let's go to the second, the second uh, idea I want to share with you. So the first one was the mindset, right? And the second one, that is one of my favorite ones, I have to, I have to tell you, is to become a resourceful person. Okay? A very resourceful person. And I want to tell you what does that mean. A resourceful person is the one that has the ability to find quick and clever ways to overcome difficulties. Mm. Difficulties is the right way to say that? <laughs> difficulties. Ability to find a quick and clever way to overcome difficulties. So, of course, Jesus is Jesus, right? Um, but Mary says, hey Jesus, there's no wine. <laughs> right? right? She looked for that. And then we also see examples in the Bible how, um, Father, tell me if I'm right or wrong, how Paul, when he was in jail, you know, instead of saying, oh, I'm in jail, you know, he says, let me try to evangelize people here. Let me figure it out how I can get some souls. So he was always looking for resources. How am I going to make this work? Or, of course, the disciples, you know, with the miracles, of the multiplication. So they were always looking for resources. How can I make this work? So I want to share with you some of the resources I use. And it doesn't mean I have, I, I was very clear about it, you know? But everything was the love for my children. What I want to do for them. How I'm going to make this work. Can you imagine having five kids that have to go to school every day? And they are not in a public school that the bus comes home and the school is 30 minutes from home every day and you don't know who's going to drive them Monday to Friday. How are you going to make that work? You know? So, um, when I became a person with a disability, is when your creativity starts. Right, Amy? We become very creative. Like, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to try to be less uh, dependent of everybody if I cannot do anything? So, for example, I remember I had to go to Shepherd Center to my appointments. And when you, the, the thing is that when you get sick and you get a meal, everybody cares about you, you know? But then after three or four months, it's over. Everybody goes back to their regular life. <laughs> it's like you are not, the, you are not the, the, new, the news anymore, you know? It's like, Oh, nothing happens to her. But then after that, everybody forget about you. <laughs> and this is when you have to, to figure it out what I'm going to do now because, because the help is almost gone. You know, the casseroles are not in the door anymore. Yeah. People is not really pasta, lasagna, ravioli anymore every day. And I have to figure it out now how I'm going to make this work because this is a reality. So I, I used to have transportation for my therapist and everything, but they, I get in a point that that's it. My husband has to go to work, my kids have to go to school, and I start to use uh, students that only have permit. They were my drivers, right? Like 15-year-old kids, you have to ride, break, go! You know? But one of the funny things was when I ordered Ubers, you have to see the Uber drivers. <laughs> I was, you know, I ordered the Uber, I said, this man doesn't know he's, he's dealing with a paraplegic lady in a wheelchair, and everything he has to do for me. You know, it, so you have to figure it out. So I remember when the Uber comes, the first thing I used to do is give them five. I, I, I have the money here. I said, here, you know. And the guy was like, you know, this, this lady's giving me tea right away. So, you know, and then I, I mean, it was a, a lady in my house giving the money. And then, okay, uh, you need to put a wheelchair in your trunk. You need to put a table under my low. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then you have to push, you know, and put her in the car and put her in the seat belt and take her to Shepherd Center. And, and, and sometimes I have terrible drivers that hate me. <laughs> or sometimes I got men like Steven that became like my brother. 
you know? He was a big man, African-American, you know, strong. And he was nice. I said, oh, can I get your card? Can I get your number? And, and he became, until now, Steven still says, yes, Paula. Oh, you, <laughs> you know? He's always available. And so you start to, to lose all the shame to ask for help because you don't have a choice. And you are in a place, and, and then in one second, the, the person next to you needs to grab the arm of that person. You have a choice. And you have to, you know, figure it out how to do And also, like, when I was in the hospital, super ill, I was trying to figure it out what I'm going to do with my children. They are coming today to visit me to the hospital. What I'm going to do? And it's funny because the way they remember the hospital is like a resort. <laughs> Chewy, can you share some memories with us? Benja. <laughs> so, hopefully you're just going to say something good. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So, you want to share with us how you remember when mommy was super ill? You can grab the phone. The phone no. <laughs> Tell us a story. I remember like every Sunday when I went, I got ice cream Sundays. Okay, so it was good ice cream, right? <laughs> Don't bring me my lunch, bring me chicken nuggets, bring coke, bring ice cream, put a movie. And my kids remember Shepherd Center like a resort, like they went in the elevator up and down 20 times, you know, <laughs> they, um, they have a pool there. So, and for me it was so impressive now because my daughter Clarita, the one you met two days ago, uh, she's going to UGA and for me it was a miracle because her SAT was a thousand. And she came, and she was, you know, only two kids from all her class are going to UGA. Her grades were good, but, you know, but when I read her essay, it was amazing. I wish I'd bring it, I'd read it to you. But her essay, the name was My Five Star Playground. Ooh. And her five star playground was Shepherd Center when she was nine years old. <laughs> And she described, it's Sunday, I'm gonna go and see mommy, there's gonna be a pool, we're gonna have a lot of fun, you know, and how she described the reality of what, what she was living. And it was not that I wanted to hide from my kids the suffering, but it was enough. You know, I don't know if some of you have seen the movie Life is Beautiful, you know, that man that is in the war with a little kid. It was kind of like that. I was in the middle of a war, or in the middle of a horrible situation, so you wanted the kids to have fun. And it's funny because they still ask me sometimes, Mom, can, I go, can we go to Shepherd Center today? <laughs> you know, can we go this weekend? So um, the other resource I use a lot was that thing of the driving thing, you know, going to a government agency called Vocational Rehabilitation and see if they were able to help me to be able to drive. Believe me, it's not easy when you go to these places. The first day I went there, they didn't believe me anything, you know? So, let me try to put this on. Thank you. All right, so uh, I remember I, I, get in the, I just did like this, you know, because I needed more extra help and I didn't believe me what was going on. And the lady says, uh, how come you're a tennis coach? <laughs> they, they didn't believe me. I said, I use a scooter and, you know, somebody takes me and I, I manage the programs. And they don't believe you. So I have to prepare. So I, I, and they, it was like being in a court, you know, and with judges. Like, they, you, you, you want to prove that you really need them or you have a disability. It's exhausting. So I went back home and my husband says, don't ever go back to that place. I say, you know what, now I'm gonna go every day. 
And if they ask me for one letter, I'm gonna bring them three. And I'm gonna give it to all of them in a big envelope with big letters. Because, because I love my kids and I don't wanna spend $20,000 from my pocket that I know they have the resources to help the disabled to go to work. Bravo! Yeah. But it's so hard because it, it, you're dealing with a disability plus the environment against you. So you have to overcome and try and push and keep going. And, and it was amazing how hard it was. But let me tell you something. When I got that driver's license finally, this is beautiful. Then this agency, finally, I got the right counselor that really married with my case, that cared about me, that believed what I was doing. And they sponsored me, they hand controls, the lift on the back of my car, and a scooter to put on the car. So it was the moment to go and buy the car, special, it, they say it has to be white, so people see you more because your eyes. It has to have features, you know, uh, so it breaks by itself a little bit and everything, you know, and it has to be 2017 and all these conditions to be more safe. And I said, okay, we have to make a loan and, and we start the process. So the agency says your equipment is approved. So I said, okay, I have to buy a car. So I was with Clarita, my daughter that came, and she was going to drive me to Toyota and start to look for one. My budget was 26,000 and I'm paying in five years, 500 a month, you know what is it, right? And I say, I can make this, I'm gonna make it on the tennis court and we pay for it. And, and when I'm ready, my husband says, Paula, there is a man that is his patient. My husband is a chiropractor. He says, Greg wants you to call him. And he was the nephew of a lady, a, wid a widow lady, from a chiropractor that was a patient of my husband. She was the most simple lady you can see, you know, with the most simple car, very nice. She, she passed away a, a year and a half ago. So I called Greg and he said, I heard you need a 2007 Toyota car. I said, yes, Greg. He says, well, what about if we give you a 2021? Oh. <laughs> Woo! like a baby, but believe me, it was not because of the car. It was because during all those two years, getting trained with these glasses, getting trained, oh, getting trained to get all my toys. Getting trained with these glasses, because you have to see them work with this little thing. I was always with fear. Am I doing the right thing? Is mommy gonna really take in the kids for ice cream or milk and she's gonna be responsible? Am I doing the right thing? It's all the time. The disabled people ask, am I taking the right risk? If it's better if I don't do it, if I do it, maybe I should not do it and just be in Uber the rest of my life. So when that happened, when I received the call, I just feel God says, here is your red road and go ahead and do it. And I have the support. So, I went with Clarita to Toyota in um, Peachtree, I don't remember the agency, and, and, and it was like, they bring me four cars, I say, ah, uh, that no, <laughs> <laughs> no, that no, no, that maybe, you know, it was, it was amazing, you know. <laughs> and then when Filomena came, you know, the white one, I say, that's Filomena, that's my car, that's the one. So, I mean, I'm sorry, it's embarrassing to share so many miracles and so many blessings because not everybody received what I received, you know? But I have to because, because it's beautiful and it's amazing. But something else that really, that really helps me to be resourceful and it helps to everybody is the love of the family and the support around the person when he's suffering and the friends. When I was in the process of that new license and everything, I got a new teacher and she said, let's go and try how you drive. And she says, turn, turn, turn. <laughs> and, and when I finished that day, I came back, I was super dizzy, I was nauseous, I was shaking, and I get in the car with Clara. We have an a old um, Toyota Sienna van, we were in the car, she was driving, I said, Clara, 
for the first time in my life, I'm gonna give up So I'm gonna give up. I'm not gonna drive. This is too hard for me. It's too hard for my eyes, it's too hard for my brain. I just can't do this. And she says something. She says, right away she look at me and she says, Mom, I don't believe you. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Okay, perfect, I'm gonna do it. Um, so something else I wanna share with you is also, um, as the resourceful, how um, sometimes you are in different situations that you want to do what everybody's doing and nobody realizes mm -hmm. that you want to do it, mm -hmm. and you're dreaming with doing it, but you can't do it. So I want to share one good one that happened to me, two good ones that happened to me. One is, I don't know if I brought, oh. One of them, I was in the beach one day with the family, and everybody's running on the sand and swimming, and you know, you're just sitting looking at everybody, wishing you can do it, but you can't do it. And my problem is that I have a lot of energy, you know? I, you know, I, I am, I am, I, I am paraplegic, but I, I don't know, I have a lot of energy. So I want to run, but I can't run. I want to hit the ball, but I can't hit the ball, you know? So I'm in this beach called Playa de Cuco, and the kids are playing on a playground, and Charles bring me a little toy that is a drum, a little drum, and he put it there, and then, you know, there's always on the beach, you are peacefully on the beach, and there's always this person that comes with music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is super loud, and you don't know if you should enjoy or get angry because you wanted to relax, and they have loud music. So it was this, this, uh, this man with having some salsa merengue, you know, things like that. And he, and he put it on, and, and I took the drum and I started. I like it, I can move, you know? <laughs> and I really, really like it so much. I said, I can put my energy on this instead of dancing, instead of running or anything. So when I came back to Atlanta, I got this toy. Show me the fact of what? So I got my front. And I realized that every time uh I can you talk about I'm wait one second, Carlitos. So so it was nice because then I said I can take all my energy, okay? So we're gonna play a song, is that good? Yeah. And if you wanna dance, you can dance. Let's not shine here. Or if you wanna just touch your hair. So this is a song about your country, about how much you love your where you're coming from. In Spanish it's called mi tierra. Okay? Say it? So we're gonna put it and we're gonna play because this is one of my favorites to play.
Maybe I was in a wedding one day. I should bring that video, I forgot. And the same thing, I'm on the wedding of my niece, and everybody dancing. And I didn't have those, these braces on that time. I wanted to dance, but I can fail. I can freeze, but I can fail, I don't know what to do. And then, I was having something on my shoulders, you know, the, how do you call this, La Parishmina, whatever. And it was a big column. So we discovered how we can dance. No. I tie myself to the column. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. So much fun. And then I realized I can dance all day. And if I'm gonna fail, I don't fail. And if my leg is fine, I don't care. You know, so it's fascinating how you can be resourceful in life. So it's like, I cannot do it this way, but I'm gonna do it this way. I can manage it this way, but I'm gonna do it this way, right? Yeah. Always be creative. And the older we get, the less we have, right? Yeah. <laughs> so then, of course, we're realistic. Well, I cannot <coughs> run like I used to do before. I cannot do what I used to do before, but I can do it different. So my poor kids are tired of me sometimes playing those bongos, right, Chuck? <laughs> yes, I know. Um, so, what I want to do now is, um, most of you have a phone, right? Or something, if you can write. I, I want to give you just a couple of minutes and I want you to write to yourself a couple of things you can do according to that challenge you share, okay? How you can be resourceful with what you have. Think, be creative. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. What you can do uh, to be resourceful. And Carlitos is going to put us some music in the back. In the meantime, we think. All right, ready? Go ahead. <laughs> Also, you can write it and you can share it with somebody next to you. What do you think you can do? If you are with your family, share together. What else can we do to have more fun and different? Let's be creative. Let's think about it, you know? How we can be more resourceful with our challenges and our limitations. Okay, thank you. It's funny because I have to confess you something. The first day when I was in minute 25, I look at the clock and I said, I'm almost over. And today is 8 o'clock and, and I'm excited and I have <laughs> and you need to go home. So I, I'm going to go forward. So of course, you can, be, you can be super resourceful. You can be the super mindset person. But what about if both of them don't work out, right? Because I was the most positive person in the world and trying the hospital when I was paralyzed. 
you know? And you can look for all the resources and, and have fun for a while, but sometimes it doesn't work too, right? right. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here, because we have the faith, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. So according to Hebrews 11, it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for an assurance about what we do not see. So, so, so many things that we don't see, but we have the faith. And you know the faith is a muscle. It's like a muscle. The same thing, I go to the gym, I become stronger. I go to the gym, I, I get weaker. The faith is free, and the faith is a personal decision we take to work on that muscle. And the stronger is the muscle, the better we feel, the better we are, the more we come to church, the more we feel better. But if somebody come and impose me the faith, usually we don't like that. You know, like when I was sick and people says, oh, believe in God, he's gonna heal you, you're gonna be fine. You know, you need to take the decision yourself to work on your faith. And there is an author, a Catholic author I love, I'm also gonna know him, I'm sure, Matthew Kelly. You know, he's a great, inspirational guy. And I love when we talk about resistance, you know? Like, every morning when we wake up right away, what, we, what comes to us a lot is resistance. It's like, I know I have to study, but I'm going, instead of that, I'm gonna watch Netflix, you know? I know I should go for a walk, but instead of doing that, I'm gonna keep sleeping and I'm gonna have four donuts for breakfast. <laughs> yes. Right? I mean, it's normal, we're human beings. We're dealing with that feeling all day. You know, and for me, it's like, I wanna write a book, but it's a lot of work. But let's go, Paula. We need to we need to help the sick. Come on, let's go. Now now you're standing, let's go ahead and do something, you know? So you have to recognize that in yourself, your weaknesses, and say, why is my resistance with my faith? Why I am stopping there? What happened to me when I was little? Who was the big nun that told me something when I was little in my school? Or who was the person that makes me look faith like a punishment? Because something happened that makes us to be away from God. And you know that. Everybody knows what is the reason. And then there are some that are always in the church and then they're full of love. But sometimes that's very easy because they have a wonderful father in earth so they can realize I have a father in heaven. But sometimes the person has so many issues that doesn't live close to God or proud or, but you need to work it out. You need to figure it out. Because we all know everything is about faith. Everything is about salvation, you know? And, and, and community, you know, this is wonderful. So don't forget that this is the most important resource on everything we do, you know? The faith, what we can give to others all the time, and the service to God. <laughs> I would say so many beautiful things happen to me, but when God gives you those little treats, you know, these, those little treats when you're having a bad day, it just helps your faith a lot. You know, I, I can tell you a hundred horrible things that happened to me, but I can tell you a thousand beautiful things that happened to me. But I wanna share just one of them very quick, and it was when I came from the hospital, I wanna paralyze, and it's summer, and I think, what am I going to do with these children in summer, you know? There's nothing I can do. God, I just trust you. My family says, send them to Costa Rica. How am I going to send them to Costa Rica if they haven't been with me for six months? And my house, it used to be a house in the back of the neighborhood, nothing special, a normal house. And then I'm there, super sick, and somebody ring the door of my house. And it was a man saying, Excuse me, we are doing a 
TV show on that house in front of your house. In 10 days, there's gonna be trucks, there's gonna be catering service, it's gonna be tons of noise. I wanted to know if we can send you somewhere. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I said, come back tomorrow, let me talk to my husband. So he searched, so what happened to offer a vacation? What happened to my life? So the next day we had a plan, you know, and they send us to Chateau and Lain. How many of you know that hotel? <laughs> so, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. It was, we went for a week. I went with a caregiver, with a babysitter. I didn't bring chickens on the car because, you know, everything was in the car, bicycles and everything. And you know, Chateau and Lain that time was managed by people from Switzerland, so the service is perfect, you know. It was amazing, all the meals. And then the bellboys carry me. They put me on the spa, on the water, in and out. I mean, the bill was like $9,000. It was amazing, you know? So, I mean, it's just present from God that comes to us when we never expect. And sometimes, like it happened to me, I was miserable for like six months, but then so many beautiful things came after. We have to know, we all know, that whatever happened in our lives, God always at the end is gonna win, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. So he always gonna, gonna win. So <coughs> of course, come and participate with the community and please, one big thing to be resourceful and with faith and mindset is please ask for help. Don't have that proud on your side. There's people there that wants to help you. There's people in the church that wants to help you. And it's so beautiful because we have a lot of people with experience. So if you are young and you don't know what to do, go with the people with experience, cry with them and say, listen, I need help, I need support. And I think at the end, what really is gonna maintain us through the challenges is the love and everything we do for serving. Serving the community and serving our friends and serving everybody around us. So anyway, thank you so much. It has been an amazing three days with all of you. I love you with all my heart and come with me. I hope I can keep in touch with all of you, uh, you know. And same thing, if you don't have my book, take it, please. And I hope to be back one of these days again. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Hey, please be seated. Uh, just hold you a couple more minutes here. Wow, was that uh, inspirational. And, and MT and I are a little upset because this is the only night we've been able to hear Paula because we've been out of town. But uh, I've heard from several folks here tonight, Paula, that they are really upset that this is the last night. And this, and this has been one of the best ever kickoffs of the Lenten season that we've ever had here at St. Anna's. So thank you for that. A lot of great thoughts, a lot of great words, uh, except for that part about Carlos being an angel. I mean, <laughs> Jan, yes, but we love you. Buddy. We love you. Anyway, uh, a little bird whispered to me that uh, Paula, of course, goes to a lot of different seminars and speaks at a lot of different locations. And I think in April, you're going to be attending one with Father Donald Calloway, who wrote the book Consec Consecration to St. Joseph. So we all know that last year was the year of St. Joseph. Yep. And I want to read you a quote here from Jim Caviezel, the actor, if you remember him. He played Jesus in the Passion of the Christ. But after reading this book, he said, if the Blessed Virgin Mary is our spiritual mother and refuge, St. Joseph is our loving spiritual father and the missing piece needed in the world searching for truth, peace, and hope. 
we need more people like Paula helping us in that search. And we thank you for that. And the Knights of Columbus want to give you this book as a token of our appreciation for what you've done this week for our parish. <laughs> thank you, and, and thank you all for coming, and for the folks joining online, thank you for joining us that way, and, and I want to thank the ladies of the nights, and that's ladies of the night, nights who uh, did all of the, uh, the food preparation this evening, and Father Dan, did you have a final word for us? I let people take control of different aspects of this parish. I, I let them lead, and I'm very proud of my family here. I thank you for being a witness to God's love for them, inspiration for them, and just be yourself. That's God's created you to be. That's you, your beautiful self. I we thank God for you. Thank you.